Okay, so welcome to our, our first online class. This is class three. Today we're, we are going to cover, I think, a very interesting topic and also a very valuable topic, not just for finance majors, but for any major, because when you get your first job, you will likely have a 401k plan. That's a retirement plan that your company offers. Or if you don't have a company with a 401k plan, you might have a Roth IRA, which is an investment vehicle to help you save for retirement uh, that, that helps you defer taxes and avoid taxes in some cases. Um, so what we're going to cover in the next few classes is what does it mean to invest, to build a portfolio. So well, today we'll define what a portfolio is and we'll cover three questions, the why, the what, and the how of investing. There's a lot there that we can cover. This class will cover the surface. There's a lot deeper dive that a student can do or any person can do related to how to build an investment portfolio. So I encourage you, take the terms that we hit in these classes and go out and do more research or listen to some podcasts, read some articles, read some books, and dive deeper because there's a lot further you can go. I'll, I'll give you some terms throughout these first few classes that you can definitely put into an internet search and find some really, really fascinating deeper dives. Uh, no question. There's a lot that you can do with this information. And so um, I think it's an important part of the class because uh, for one reason, it's, it's a very common question in interviews. A lot of interviewer, inter interviewers like to ask the question, what if I had $100,000 to invest? How would you help me um, decide what to do with that $100,000? So that's exactly the question we're going to answer in these next few classes is someone comes up to you with a lot of money. They want to invest it. They want to do something with it. They don't know where to start. How would you help them with that, with that question? So uh, we'll see how far we get in this first class. But let's start with the basic definition of what is a portfolio, an investment portfolio. So an investment portfolio, it's a collection of assets. Notice that word assets. So when you're taking notes, I strongly encourage you to have a, a, some paper and pencil out and take handwritten notes. You don't have to take handwritten notes. You can certainly type them. You can have the class notes open and type in those, but I really encourage students to actually write down what we're talking about in class. There's something about writing stuff down that really helps the brain retain this information. But the other thing to do while you're going through here is I'll hit certain terms that I think are really critical. And if I were you, I would maybe start a, a separate list of key terms to do more research on, to look more into. And that word assets is a really important key term. Assets is essentially anything that has some future value. And related to an investment portfolio, we're looking at assets related to anything that we normally held we hold as an investment. So one thing you can put into your notes to distinguish between the word asset and the word security. The word security is a more limited word than the word asset. So all securities are assets, but not all assets are security. So what is a security? A security is a special type of asset that is traded on public markets. So we'll talk specifically about stocks and bonds and cash um, not all cash is securities, but a lot of cash is securities. But cash, bonds, and stocks, those are securities that we can buy on the market. They're very liquid, most of them, although we'll talk about bonds. Not all bonds are very liquid, but most of them are, are a lot of them are publicly traded. But they're much more liquid. You can get to them very easily if you have a broker brokerage account set up with a broker. We'll talk about that later as we get into that third question of how to invest. <clears throat> um, but securities are those assets we can buy. Just probably pretty much anyone on the street can buy securities. Now, asset is a greater 
greater term. It includes securities, but also includes assets that are not securities. So if, if you invest in real estate, so let's say you buy a few houses around San Antonio, uh, San Antonio, and you want to rent them out, that house would be an asset, but not a security. You can't buy that residential house on some public market somewhere. You can't buy it in your brokerage account. You will have to, as a buyer, go out and find the seller, and the two of you negotiate that price. Very unlike a stock. With a stock, you don't have to, if you want to sell some stock, so you bought some stock and now you want to sell it, you do not have to go out and find the buyer for your stock. You just go to your brokerage, you say you want to sell, your broker will take care of all of that, find, find the buyer, you can sell your assets. So assets uh, include securities, but also include very illiquid assets like real estate, like commodities. We're going to talk about some of these assets. So an investment portfolio is a collection of assets, securities, real estate, commodities, and they're held for a particular future purpose. So that's really important to understand, a future purpose. I've mentioned retirement a couple of times. That's obviously a very important reason that people build a portfolio. Hopefully your parents and grandparents have built a really good retirement portfolio so they won't be moving in with you. Um, but that's a, that's a future purpose for investing. You should probably already be starting on your retirement portfolio especially in your first job. Once you get your first job, you get that 401k plan, and we'll talk about 401k plans here in a few classes. <clears throat> you want to start saving for retirement because at some point you will no longer have income, you'll retire, and you're going to live off your portfolio. So you need a portfolio that will sustain you through your retirement years when you don't have that, uh, that uh, earned income. Or you may have children that you want to give them an education, a college education. And so, uh, you know, when they're born uh, at age zero and you think they're going to go to college at age 18, then you have 18 years to save up for their, their education. And there are vehicles you can use that provide tax deferred ways to invest and save for, for um, college for your children. <clears throat> you might be saving money for a down payment on the house. Or you might say, you know, I have plenty of money. I have enough money for retirement. Uh, my kids are all moved out. I own my house. I just want them saved to leave money for my heirs. So those are all reasons why you might invest. It gets to our very first question we'll talk about, which is why are you investing? But that's an investment portfolio. It's a collection of things that have some future value that you're holding for some future purpose. <laughs> so let's talk about what questions you would ask somebody if they came to you and said, hey, I have some money. I want to know what I want, what to do with this money. Can you help me? And the first question you're going to ask is, hey, why are you investing? What is your primary objective for investing? <clears throat> In other words, why does this portfolio exist? I remember I was at a gathering of a bunch of USA people, people that I knew, um, I forget what the gathering is about. It might have been someone's retirement. Um, so I saw a lot of people I had not seen in a while, and I was talking to them. And one gentleman I had not seen in a very long while I'd say, Oh, wow, it's good to get, see you again, Paul. And he introduced me to his wife. And his wife said, He, he said, Okay, Ron Sweet, he, he runs investments at USAA. Uh, and as soon as he heard that, she said, Ron, should I buy gold? Right off the, blo off the block. Ron, should I buy gold? And I'm like, wait a minute. Uh, should you buy gold? Tell me first, why are you investing at all? Give me your reason for why you're investing. It's possible gold would be a very good investment to make. Um, but it's possible gold doesn't make sense for your portfolio. So let's figure out why you're investing. Why do you want to buy anything that's an asset? And then once we know why you're investing, we can then figure out what types of investments you should buy. So the purpose of the, of the portfolio is a liability. A liability is some future outflow, like retirement. So when you're investing for retirement, you got to think about, wow, what, what kind, type of investments work well for a retirement portfolio? So my risk management, risk management class, 
discuss this as a couple of you are in both this class and in my risk management class. That class goes in much, much more detail about retirement. But here, just, just in a nutshell, you want to ask what drives that liability? What makes that liability go up and down? Because I want to buy assets that are going to meet the requirements of that liability. So if there's something out there that's going to cause that liability to shoot up 10, 20, 30 percent, I sure better have an asset that's going to, going to shoot up 10, 20, 30 percent. So what makes your retirement plan suddenly shoot up higher? Well, one thing is inflation. One of the things that makes your retirement much more expensive is if we have a lot of inflation, inflation in the United States. Because then when you retire, things are going to cost a lot more money. So inflation is a very important consideration. Right now, inflation is very tame, very low. The Federal Reserve has actually been disappointed that inflation has been well below its 2% target. And that's because the economy is not, not, hasn't been all that strong, obviously, with COVID-19 slowing things down. Maybe by the time you watch this video, inflation maybe has become a concern. Probably not. People are not worried about inflation right now. But if inflation suddenly were to take off like it did in the, did in the 1970s, then that would have a huge impact on people's retirement planning. So can you find assets that will do well if inflation suddenly takes off? Longevity is a big issue for retirement. If you're going to die at 70, you don't need, the retire you don't need to build as big of a portfolio for retirement than if you're going to die at 110. So longevity, how long you live. So if you think you're, you're only going to make it to 75 or 80 years old, and then suddenly you're 80 years old and you're very healthy, um, you've got a problem. You probably did not save enough for retirement. So longevity is a big issue. Now, longevity is a tough one. If you suddenly realize that you're going to live much longer, maybe there's a, a disease that runs in your family that tends to mean people in your family don't live much past 75 or 80. And then there's suddenly some new medical find that, uh, that directly addresses that medical condition. And now instead of seeing yourself dying at 75 or 80, you might live to 90 or 95. And suddenly you thought a million dollars was enough for retirement. And now you think you need $2 million. Well, that's, that's a tough thing to find an asset that is going to hedge that risk. There are not assets out there that suddenly shoot up in value if you live too long, except for one. There is one. I talk about it in my life insurance class. There is a product that does do extremely well if you live too long. That's, that's called um, a, a, an immediate annuity or even a longevity annuity. Those are products that pay you more if you live longer. But it's really hard to find assets like that. But you want to think about that. What happens if I live a lot longer than I planned? What am I going to do then with my portfolio? And then interest rates. Interest rates are important to almost every liability because every liability in today's dollars is the present value of that future liability. And that present value, we use interest rates to discount those. So when interest rates fall, future liabilities rise in value in today's terms. And so we need assets that will go up if interest rates fall. And so that's what we're looking at is when you know what your liability is, you know why you are investing, then you want to find assets that specifically address those risks that you see in that liability. <clears throat> Another way of saying this, you want to find assets that help mitigate the risk of the liability. So in my risk management class, we'll talk a lot about how should one invest in order to back a pension plan. <clears throat> And that's one area that's of controversy because my view is most pension plans are doing it absolutely wrong. Um, and so we won't talk about that in this class, but it is an issue. I love to talk about it because it is very, very interesting. Um, so how do you do this? Well, one way you can figure this out, um, what assets you should buy, what makes sense is your risk tolerance. So one of those inputs is how much risk can you handle as an investor? Um, and so is there a way to assess that? Is there a way for you to figure out what your risk tolerance is versus someone else? So right here I brought up 
and you, you can Google this. This is another thing you could actually put on that list of other things in research. Just type in risk tolerance questionnaire. Here they call it the investor profile questionnaire, but they get the risk tolerance really quickly. I use Charles Schwab's. I pulled up theirs. Uh, Charles Schwab purchased the broker, brokerage business from USAA. So my brokerage account moved over to Charles Schwab. So far, I've been very, very happy. It's been a really, really good experience. Um, but they have this website where they have a risk tolerance. They also have time horizon. We're going to talk, going to talk about time horizon, which I think is actually the most important, important question to ask when you're investing for the future. But they have a risk tolerance questionnaire and look at the type of questions that they ask. The first one is a horizon question. So I'm going to, I'm going to say horizon is the most important question and they start with that. I, be, I, be, I will begin with drawing my money in three years or less, three to five years, six to 10 years or 11 years. So if you're investing for retirement, as young as you are as a college student, you're, you would click this very last one and you'll get 10 points and they're whatever scoring they do here. The next question they ask is, well, once you start taking money out, how many years will you need that money? Well, if you're investing for investing to buy a house, then maybe you're going to buy a house in five years. So you would click this. But once you need that down payment on the house, you're going to need to pay it immediately because it's a down payment for the house. So you'll need it in less than two years. If you're investing for your child's uh, uh, education and they've just been born, then you have 11 or more years, but you're going to need to spend it over two to five years. You hope that he or she will finish college in two to five years. And so then you would only get a point of one here. So what they're saying is the higher score, the more risk you can take, the more you can invest in stocks. The lower your score, the less you can have in stocks, the more you need, need safe investments like cash. And we'll talk more about that. Um, so they have a time horizon score. So you're, you're investing for retirement. You're probably going to put 18 there. That would probably be your score right there, 18. So I can't put the number in there, but if you were to do this, you could probably do this questionnaire online. So if your time horizon is less than three, they say your score is three, don't move any further. Um, you know, stop because you need your money so quickly. It really doesn't, you don't want to buy stocks. You don't want to buy longer term assets. It doesn't make sense. You need to invest very short term, keep it very high quality. But if your score is more than three, then yeah, you can move on because here's where we're going to, going to figure out if you should be investing in stocks. So the risk to qu tolerance questionnaire then starts asking you first about your knowledge of investing. If you're extremely knowledgeable, you get a 10. If you're not knowledgeable, you get a one. Now, obviously, if you have extensive knowledge, you probably won't do the questionnaire at all because you already know what you're doing. Uh, if you're not knowledgeable, you, you click a one. The next question, they're trying to figure out the type of person you are. Are you worried about losing money? Are you worried about making money? I hate these questions. I think they're horrible. Let me tell you why. <clears throat> studies have shown over and over again when you're in a market where stocks have just been going up the last few years like we saw in 1998 1999 like we saw in in 2006 and 2007 like we've seen up until covid until 2020 and covid-19 where the stock market in fact that was the longest stock bull market a bull market is when stocks go up for a long period of time the longest bull market we've ever had in a stock market was from 2009 through 2020 or 2019. Um, we had a little bit of a sell-off in early 2019, but a very, very long bull market. Studies have shown after a long bull market, people tend to answer these questions much more aggressively. They're down here on the eight. When markets have sold off like in, in uh, April and May, March, April, May of 2020 with COVID-19, people tend to answer more conservatively. Why is that such a bad thing? Well, what that means is people get more aggressive with their investments after a long bull market, which is when they probably should be more cautious. When markets have been up for a long time and they look expensive, that's when you should be more cautious. 
but these questionnaires put them much more aggressive. And in a 2020, when the market has sold off 30%, that's when you should be more aggressive. That's when you should be jumping out there and buying stocks. But that's when people answer these questions very conservatively. So what these questionnaires do, in my opinion, is get people to buy stocks when they're expensive and get them to sell stocks when they're cheap, which is the exact opposite of what you want to do. They ask what you currently own. Um, that's kind of a knowledge question. They're just trying to see, you know, if you're comfortable with international securities already, then you'll probably be okay doing that going forward. Um, then they ask another question, which again, I hate these questions. If the market, stock market just lost 25% in value, what would you do? Sell everything or buy more? And again, when the market's been up for 10 years, people say, oh, I'll just buy more. I know me. I mean, I, I, I love stock markets. If the market falls, I'll buy more. If the market has just crashed, most people say, you know what? I can't take it anymore. This world may be falling apart. Who knows what this pandemic's going to do? The market could fall another 30%. I'm getting out. So these questionnaires really drive really bad behavior. Then they try to do the exact same question again, but here with with um, with kind of scenarios. Um, <clears throat> the figure is a hypothetical, not represent the performance of any particular investment. So they're asking you which of these would you be most comfortable with? I don't think most people really fully comprehend these what this means and so I'm not sure they get a good question there but then you put your risk tolerance if you get a high score they're going to push you more into stocks if you get a low score they're gonna push you more in the safe investment like bonds we'll talk about bonds and stocks here pretty soon to get into that but that's what these questionnaires are trying to figure out and I don't think they work I remember speaking to one firm, it was Barclays Bank, and they had a risk questionnaire, and I told them how I really disliked these questionnaires. And the guy told me, and I'm going to tell you his secret, but he said, I'll tell you a secret if you promise not to tell anyone. And I didn't promise not to tell anyone, so I'm okay telling you. Um, he just asked that question and started to tell me without waiting for my answer. But um, he said, if you look at our risk questionnaire, yeah, it tells people if you answer this, go to page four. If you answer this, go to page six. But he said, if you go through all the questionnaires, what you'll discover is the only thing that drives them to the different pages is the horizon questionnaire. Nothing else really matters. And so we've actually tricked them to make it look like we're, we're assessing their risk tolerance, getting a detailed plan for them as an individual. But ultimately, the only thing we're deciding on is your horizon. Now, when I was at USAA, I caused a stir. I was working with the wealth management group. They didn't care much for me. There was a little bit of friction between that group and me because they felt like they knew as much about investing as I did. And I really could tell that they did not know as much and they did not like me questioning. And I think there was a little bit of insecurity, um, but I wanted to question everything. I wanted everything that we did to be a perfect product. And so I questioned them on their risk question, risk tolerance questionnaire and they said oh no Ron we've studied that it's scientific and I knew they had not um, most firms don't they buy one off the shelf they just assume that the vendor they bought it from had done a de detailed research but I had gone through and answered their questionnaire in all different ways I'd answered it this way then this way all different combinations and what I discovered was slight differences in answers whether you answer B or C gave radically different asset allocations. And I, my thought was, wow, how can, you, how can you have confidence that because the person answered C instead of B, they should be 70% in stocks versus 40% in stocks? That did not make sense to me. Have you really gone through and thought through these questions? The other thing that bothered me is they had several questions that were essentially answer, asking the same thing, but in different ways. What happens if someone answers A on one of those questions, but D on the next question? That's the, the system, system should stop and say, wow, this person doesn't really understand the questions. But their model didn't do that. They answered A on one and D on the other, even though they're completely inconsistent. They gave them the score and they told them the asset allocation. So I am generally very, very negative. If you want to do more research on this, one thing I'd recommend you to do 
is do the Ibbotson Risk Tolerance Questionnaire. Ibbotson is Roger Ibbotson. He is a professor at uh, the Chicago School of Business. Uh, I've met him a couple of times. He's very famous. You should read some of his articles. He writes some articles that are very unreadable because they're extremely technical, very jargon heavy. And he's written some articles that are very easy to read. Uh, but his last name is spelled I-B-B-O-T-S-O-N, Ibbotson, with two Bs, Ibbotson, I-B-B-O-T-S-O-N. Um, and due to Ibbotson risk, risk tolerance questionnaires, his is probably the most famous. Uh, his firm got purchased by Morningstar, so Morningstar, I think, uses the Ibbotson questionnaire. It's very similar to the one here. Um, the times that I've taken it with different people, it's, it's given me answers that I thought were reasonable. I still don't like these questionnaires, but you know, at least I, I thought it gave decent answers for people that I would, I would test it with. But there's others out there. If you have a broker or your parents have a brokerage, um, you might see what risk tolerance questionnaire they have or over, over the break. You know, if you go home over the spring break, over the summer break and see your family, he might sit down with them and work through one of these risk tolerance questionnaires and just see if you like the answer after after the end, after you've done this class. So that's the risk tolerance questionnaire. I, I really believe Horizon is the most important. So as you're working through these questions, so your first question on exam one is a massive question and you want to go in depth. Some students really go way too shallow in their answer to that question. It's just essentially everything we're going to talk about in the next few classes. Um, so you want to make sure when you're discussing the why question, why are they investing, you want to make sure the word horizon is in your answer. When will they need the money? I think that is the single most important question. And the main reason, it's not because I don't think risk tolerance is not important. I think it's very important. What I question is, can we really figure it out for an individual by just having them answer a few questions? I really doubt that risk tolerance is something we can assess with a few simple questions. And a main problem I have, again, is that the way people answer risk, quest, risk tolerance questionnaires is heavily influenced by what stock markets and bond markets have done recently, especially stock markets. People tend to answer the question much more aggressively after a strong stock market and much more conservatively, uh, conservatively after a weak stock market, which gives them answers that's the opposite of what they probably should be doing. So if you don't know the why, if you don't know the liability you're investing for, what drives it, what influences it, what the horizon is, I'm, gonna, or I'm going to argue you cannot invest su successfully. That's why when the lady said, Ron, should I invest in gold? Should I buy gold? It's like, well, how, I can't answer that question. What are you buying the gold for? Are you buying it to, um, you know, to, to, to buy some uh, some uh, garden, gardening tools next weekend? Well, no, don't buy gold. Just keep it in your money market account. If you're buying it for, for retirement, then yeah, maybe gold would make some sense. Once you get that why question, then the biggest question, which is the what, this is where we're going to spend the bulk of our time in the next few classes, is the what class, the what question. What can you invest in? This is referred to as asset allocation. It's also known as beta risk. So here's a term that you can certainly do a search on the internet. Um, you might you might, if you search on the word beta, we are going to talk a lot about the word beta. You should have had beta in your uh, business finance class in 3013. We are going to talk about beta again in this class, but the word beta has several different meanings. Obviously, there's meanings outside of finance, um, but within finance, beta has taken on a life of its own. Uh, so beta is a term we use in the capital asset pricing model, and we'll certainly see beta here uh, pretty soon in part of that model. But the word beta also has been used to talk about someone's exposure to certain different types of assets, your beta risk. So something you might look up is beta risk versus alpha risk. I talk about that in my risk management class. Beta risk is what asset classes are you in? We're going to talk about those things like U.S. large company stocks. 
our international stocks, our treasury bonds. Those are asset classes. And so we use the word beta risk to say, well, what asset classes are you in? The word alpha risk are those risks that you're taking to try to beat the market. You're trying to make more than the market. That's an alpha risk. Alpha risk. We're going to talk about that when we get into question three on how. Do you want to try to beat the market or do you want to just buy the market and do whatever the market does? So beta risk is related to what assets you're going to buy. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about asset classes and what drives them, how to understand their different characteristics. That's a very, very important part of this class and a major part of exam one. It's essentially the almost 90% of exam one is, is this, this issue. So what asset classes are available to you? And I remember an article I, I read. I have it linked here in the notes. Uh, you can get into that article. It's an article by William Sharp, and William Sharp is the man who came up with the capital, capital asset pricing model, which is where we use beta. So William Sharp wrote an article I, re I read early in my career, and he talked about asset classes and how many as asset classes you should have. So we could just have two asset classes, stocks and bonds, but then that may be too few. Or we could have tens of thousands of asset classes. We could talk every single security is an asset class. So Apple stock is an asset class. Exxon Mobil stock is an asset class. Um, Chevron bonds is an asset class. So every single security can be an asset class. We have 50,000 asset classes. And so William Sharp asked the question in this article, how many asset classes make sense? What is optimal? And he used this term. I did not know this term before. My English teacher friend knew this term, but I don't know, use this term. See if you can use this term uh, this week with some people and see if they, they understand it. But it's the term pars parsimonious. Parsimonious. And another, another way to say it is stingy. So what William Sharp is saying is we want to be parsimonious with this decision. What, he want, what he's saying is we want to have enough asset classes that we can explain the risk that we are taking, but no more. Now, why would he say that? Why would we want 10 asset classes instead of 15? Or why would we want to have 10 asset classes instead of 5? Well, what he's saying is 5 may not be enough to explain the risk that you're taking. There may be a lot of unexplained risk. Um, and, and if that's the case, then you're not, you're not going to do a good job explaining to someone how to invest a portfolio because there's going to be these surprises, these big risks that are going to show up that are going to kind of shock you. But if you have 15 asset classes and you over-explain risk, you have more asset classes than you need, then you're taking on a lot of extra work that is completely unnecessary. So the key here is be parsimonious, be stingy, have just enough to explain what you need to explain when it relates to risk, but not more than that. So let's look at this article and just see what exactly Sharp is saying here because um, I think it's really, really important. In fact, it radically changed my whole view of investing and I, I started doing stuff very differently in my job. So here's this article. You can see it was written in 1992. Now I started my career as an accountant in 1986 I worked as an accountant for a couple of years, and then I went into finance for about five or six years, and then I went into my first investment job. Just shortly after this article was written, I read this article, and as soon as I read it, at the time I was in a job where I was working for someone who wasn't very, very quantitative. Uh, he was kind of old school investing, and it was really great for me because, because he, since he wasn't very quantitative, I was much more quantitative than he was. I'm not a math genius or anything. You know, my, my math skills are pretty, pretty average for a finance person, but much stronger than his. And so I read this article and said, we should do this. He, he essentially let me do whatever I wanted to do because he just, he didn't want to read the article and figure it out. And so I, I, I started doing this at USAA and I, it made perfect sense to me to do it this way. So what is William Sharp saying? I would recommend that you read this article. If you don't want to do it during the semester, it's just too busy, then, then print this out and put it on your read list for uh, the, the summer break. <clears throat> now, 
So what is he talking about here? Well, he's got this fancy formula here, which you know very, very well. You've seen this before. Essentially what he's trying to do is set up a multi-factor model to see if he can explain one thing. Uh, here he's talking about the return of portfolio, R, the return of portfolio, by using all these factors, factor one, factor two, factor three. In his model, these factors are different asset classes, and I'll show you the asset classes he came up with. And at the very end, he has an error term. And what he wants to do is he wants to eliminate that error term as much as he can. Get it as small as possible. Maybe not absolutely as small as possible, but get it to a reasonably low level so that he can explain the return of his portfolio and really the risk of his portfolio. He can explain the risk of his portfolio by these different asset classes, these different factors. Now, you already know this from your finance class. I mean, from your statistics class. In your statistics class, they gave you the term R squared. Hopefully you remember R squared. If you don't remember it, go out and look it up. Go Google it. It's an extremely important term. But R squared tells you how much of this, the risk of this return, how much of the volatility in this return can be explained by these VAC factors. And if you can get an R squared of 100%, then your error term is zero and you can explain entirely what's going on with R by these factors. If your R squared is 60%, then your error term is 40% of what's going on. And so you got 40, you have 40% of what's going on with the risk and volatility of your return that you cannot explain with these factors. Obviously, 100% is too high. That'd be every single asset in the entire world individually. Um, just be way too much, too much work. Uh, so 100% R squared, that's too much. We can't get that high. But 60% R squared is way too low. You don't want to leave 40% out there unex unexplained. And so that's what he's talking about here. And here he shows the R squared. He gives you the formula for it. It's a fairly simple formula, but uh, you don't need this formula because in, um, in Excel, Excel does this for you. Now, if those taking my risk management class or will take my risk management class maybe in the future, we do a lot of work with this. We actually do what he's doing in this article in that class. This is called style analysis. He might call it somewhere style analysis. I can't remember if he called it style analysis in this article, but that's what it became known as style analysis. Uh, if you want to actually do style analysis, maybe you can't take my risk management class, but you want to learn it because it's a really important term, then just email me and I'll send you the videos for those, those exercises and you can easily teach yourself how to do it. Uh, reason it's important is style and analysis is something you're, if you're a finance major, it is something you're likely to see early in your career. So there, there are software packages that will probably do this for you, but it's really important, I think, to do this manually, understand the mechanics, the, the calculations behind the scenes. So when you have a software package like a Morningstar model or Lipper model do this for you, um, you know exactly what it's doing. You understand the guts behind it, and that is a powerful, powerful thing to understand. Now, a lot of students don't go that deep, and they're completely at the mercy of the software package. Whatever it says, whatever that package says, that's what they say. Well, that's what it says. That's what I got to I gotta go with, but if you understand the underlying calculations, boy, it's a powerful uh, advantage to you in the business. So he, he uses the word parsimony. There it is, parsimony. He wants to be parsim parsimonious. What does he mean by that? He wants to get a good R squared value with fewest asset classes possible. So he wants an acceptable R squared but with few asset classes. And this is what he came up with. Here are his, his asset classes. His asset classes are similar, similar to the ones we are going to use, but not identical. He has something he calls bills. Well, that's we're going to call that cash. He has something called intermediate term bonds, government bonds. We are going to call that intermediate term high quality. He has something called long-term government bonds. We're going to call that long-term high quality. He has corporate bonds. We're going to call that medium 
and low quality. We'll get into the different categories there. Mortgage related securities, we're going to call those mortgage related securities. Large cap value stocks, we're going to call that U.S. large capitalization value stocks. So our category here is essentially exactly the same as his. Large cap growth stocks, we're going to use that same category. Medium cap stocks, we're going to do that. We're not going to call them medium cap. We're going to call them mid cap. That's the new term. He called them medium cap, but it's, it's changed to mid cap, M-I-D cap. Small cap, we'll use that one as well. You'll see what those are. Don't worry if you don't know the definitions now because we'll definitely get into those definitions. Non-U.S. bonds, that's one class where I'm going to talk about why we don't use that as an asset class. He did, but we will not. We're going to move that somewhere else. Then he has a really strange couple of stocks at the end, European stocks and Japanese stocks. We're going to combine these two and call them developed market stocks. What he doesn't have is emerging market and frontier market stocks. So we're going to have some categories he doesn't have. We're going to combine some of his categories. But he has, I think this is 13 asset classes. I can't remember exactly, but a little over 10 asset classes that he uses. At USA, I think we use 13 asset classes, a different group. Uh, and then we actually expanded that to 26 asset classes because we had we had two companies that were taxed very differently, so we had to do we had to do the math very differently. But let me show you what he means by um, parsimony, pars parsimony. <clears throat> so what he did here is he took he took a portfolio. It's called the Trustees Commingled Fund. It's a U.S. portfolio. It doesn't have you know it's in the U.S. It does have some non-U.S. securities in it, but not much. It's predominantly U.S. security portfolio. And he wanted to ask, what risk is this portfolio taking? Another way of saying saying this is what beta risk is this portfolio taking? So he ran he ran his model three times. He first ran it unconstrained, then he constrained it, and then he constrained it one last time. The first time he ran it unconstrained, this is what he said were the risks that portfolio was taking. So you can look through here. There's two problems with the unconstrained. First of all, it adds up to 73%. Well, if you have a portfolio, you want the different pieces to add up to 100%, not the 72%. Now you got a really good R squared. That's great, 95%. So he said, if, if, if you took um, some generic asset classes, We'll talk about some index funds here in a while. And you put your money at these allocations into that generic portfolio, you would get a portfolio. Look, you could explain 95% of this trustees portfolio with that generic portfolio allocated like this. But that doesn't make sense. We want to explain 100% of the portfolio. So then you constrain the portfolio to make it add up to 100%. You can see that as R squared dropped a little bit, it has to drop a little bit, but not much. Well, this makes a lot more sense, but here's where the second problem is. We have these massive negative numbers. Not everybody can go negative. It's really hard what we call sorting an asset class. That's really difficult to do. It's not as difficult today with uh, what we talk, talk about in a little bit later in the class with exchange traded funds. It is possible, but there are a lot of investors, probably most retail investors, that can only be positive allocation. They can't have negative allocations. So he decides to, to constrain it one last time. You can see the last constraint is he doesn't allow, allow any negative allocations. And when he did that, he found out this portfolio is essentially 70% value stocks and 30% small cap stocks. Now we're, we're going to break up our small cap stocks in the growth and value. So I bet this portfolio is probably 70% value large company stocks and 30% value small company stocks. That's my guess, but he didn't break up his mid cap stocks and small cap stocks between value and growth. Now he has a very small allocation in European stocks, but that's just probably statistical noise. So this portfolio is probably 70% large cap value and 30% small cap value. Now his R squared dropped down to 92%. So there's 88%, 8% is the portfolio's risk 
he cannot explain with these 13 acid classes. Is it 13? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Got close. It's 12 acid classes. So with 12 acid classes, there's 8% of the risk he cannot explain. In my risk management class, I tell students, see if you can get above 90% when you're trying to explain the risk of the portfolio. They pick their own fund, their own portfolio, and they, they do a, um, a style analysis of. But many of them have trouble getting above 80%, and it just can get, get a little tough. But that's what style analysis is, and that's what he's talking about here. He's saying these 12 asset classes is enough. For most investment portfolios, you can explain over 90% of the risk they're taking. There's no reason to add more, more asset classes because that's just, that's just more work. So when we get to the what question, we want to know uh, how many asset classes make sense for us. You'll probably have the same list of asset classes if you're in wealth management and you're actually doing this for a living. Your firm will probably have a list of asset classes that are available for you to suggest to your client. Uh, it just depends on the customer and what they can do. So remember the lady asked, could she buy gold? Should she buy gold? Well, gold is a special asset class that has some unique characteristics. It's not as easy to buy as stocks and bonds. And so maybe she could buy gold, but it depends on what she has available to, to her, what kind of broker she's using, what kind of assets she's comfortable buying. Um, so, you know, it depends what's available, but we're trying to make sure we can explain as much risk as possible using the R squared formula. Here's the R squared formula. I use the cor there's actually an R squared formula in Excel. I use the correlation formula and just square because that's what R squared is. It's correlation squared. Um, so you can think of R squared as the explanatory power. It's also known as style, you know, it's, it's a measurement of style analysis how much of the volatility in your portfolio that you're looking at that you can explain by another portfolio. And in this case, the other portfolio is generic asset classes that we're going to allocate to, that is put a certain percentage in each, each one and see how much we can explain the risk of the portfolio we're interested in. And that's what style analysis is. So there's another term, style analysis that you can Google um, and see what comes up. Uh, I don't know what will come up, um, no telling what Google searches you have set up, but, um, but just give you an example, like I was giving you before, you pick five asset classes and your R squared is 70%. You then do 10 asset classes. You can now explain 98% of what's going on with your portfolio. Then you try 15 asset classes and your R squared goes from 98% to 98.1%. So I actually had to do this with my boss and I had to do this at USAA. What asset classes are you going to include? And we went through this process. I think that's where the number 13 came to me because we had 13 asset classes. Uh, why 13? Because it gave us a good R squared. There's no reason to go to 15. 98.1 versus 98. That's just not going to help you. So a good example is we'll talk about uh, one asset class some people like to use is real estate investment trust. These are stocks that buy real estate. And some people say, wow, that's a great asset class because it's like buying real estate. Well, we'll talk later in the class that real estate investment trust is not really like buying real estate. It's really like buying U.S. small company stocks. Uh, it really doesn't add to your R squared at all. But if you add that as an asset class, real estate investment trust, you now have to go out and interview a bunch of real estate investment trust managers. You have to interview them. You may have to have 20 or 30 of them come in and talk to you. You got to figure out which one you like the best. Your committee has to meet and vote on which one's on your short list. It's a tremendous amount of work. When I was at USAA, we would interview four to 500 managers a year. It was a lot of work. It got very tiresome, very repetitive. It's really tough to tell, do you like A better than B or C? So 10 asset classes is a lot less work. Than 15 asset classes. You go from 10 to 15, your workload goes up 50%. You do not want to do that. That's why you want to be parsimonious. It's just not worth the extra work, just have that slightly extra explanatory power. Now, what, what is key to parsimony? The key really is that asset classes have some unique characteristic that you want to capture. Maybe they have some uniqueness related to return. 
maybe some uniqueness related to volatility, maybe some uniqueness related to correlation. Correlation is usually the most important one, that this asset class helps you diversify the risk of other asset classes. So we'll talk about that. We're going to talk about that quite a bit, especially with, with alternative assets. They tend to be purchased in order to diversify the portfolio. So we'll get into that, some of these terms here. Uh, but those are those are the type that's those are the three things that really decide whether you should set up real invest real real estate investment trusts as a separate asset classes or just include them as part of small company stocks. And real estate investment trusts historically have looked so much like any other US small company stock that it's better not to separate them out and just treat them like part of this US small company stock. Um, Remember, correlation can range from negative one to positive one. So if something has a correlation of one, there's not much diversification benefit at all. Probably no reason to break that out as a separate asset class. A correlation of negative one, that's essentially a hedge. And that's a very unique asset class, but they range anywhere in between there. So there's the what question. What we're going to be spending a lot of time doing is going through our asset classes You'll see how many we have. We have a potential, I guess, of as, as many as up to 20, the way I have it have it structured. But we'll see. Uh, you know, you probably wouldn't use all of those. But, but I'm going to cover a long list of potential asset classes and talk about their expected return, their volatility, volatility, and their correlations. And that's a big chunk of the first exam. But let's get to the last question very quickly here. We're going to spend a lot more time on the third question after the first exam, but that's how. How are we going to invest? The execution of your portfolio. And you need to answer three questions here. You start off with what is your strategic allocation? Your strategic allocation, you might even do a Google search on this. I'm not sure what will come up, but strategic allocation, the way I like it, I've heard it explained is if, if you're going to, uh, you know, do want to sign up one of those people who's going to fly to Mars and stay on Mars for 30 years and then hopefully get back. And so your portfolio is just going to sit there for 30 years and you won't have time. You won't be able to do anything with it. You don't have anybody that can take care of it for you. So you just want to buy your portfolio and let it sit there for 30 years. What, what would be that strategic allocation? Your long-term allocation, your normal portfolio, what you would nom normally do, Another term you could search on, I'm not sure what you would find here, but some people for strategic allocation also use the term policy portfolio. That is, what does our policy say we normally do? That's our policy portfolio. So what is that? What's your normal asset allocation? We're, we're going to talk about that. The second question on exam one is going to, is going to really get into the strategic versus the tactical allocation. The second question you're going to ask is, I'm, am I going to do this myself or am I going to hire someone else to do this? If you do it yourself, you'll have to have a brokerage account and you'll buy your own individual securities, which stocks you want, which bonds you want. If you hire a manager, you'll go to Fidelity or T. Rowe Price um, or Vanguard or BlackRock and you'll hire someone there and give them your money and you'll tell them you decide what assets to buy. So do it yourself or hire a manager. The last question you'll ask is, and there's kind of two parts to this, is are you going to be tactical? Are you going to, going to try to beat the market? So your strategic portfolio says you want 20% and U.S. small company stocks, but you think those stocks are really cheap right now. So you want to go 30%. You want to be tactical. You want to make a bet, uh, your tactical bet. Which asset class or which security do you want to over over allocate to, put more in than normal. Um, and that's a big part, that's the second question on exam once, you are, we are going to get some good practice on doing this. So that's a tactical bet. Well, some people are active investors. They want to beat the market. They're constantly looking at, I wanna sell this, buy this, sell this, buy this. But then there's passive investors. They say, you know what? My chance of beating the market is practically zero. I have very little time to mess with it. I'm just going to buy the market. We'll talk about that, buying index funds, funds that try to just replicate the market. They just buy the stock market. Whatever the stock market does, that's how you do. That's a passive investor. Or you can be some combination of the two. You can be active on some things, passive on some things. You can be active on your asset allocation, but passive 
on which specific securities you buy. So you might say, I want to have 30% in small cap stocks, but I'm just going to buy the small cap stock index fund and just buy the market. So there's a whole bunch of combinations there, but those are the three questions that we're going to deal with. On exam one, you just high level this question, but later in the class after exam one, we will definitely get into much more detail on this question. <laughs> so execution is what do you actually buy? What actual investment vehicles like stocks, mutual funds, those things we're going to, going to talk about later, what are you gonna do or whom do you hire? Which portfolio manager do you hire? So this is where that term, remember I talked about beta risk, here's where the term alpha risk comes in. If you're going to try to beat the market, you are taking alpha risk. And when you take alpha risk, that is the risk that the person you hire will not do a good job of beating the market and you'll actually underperform the market. The market's up 10%, but you're only up 6% because the person you, you hired did a really bad job. So, so your portfolio can be strategic. You should have a strategic portfolio. You should know what your normal position is. And there is a famous study out there. I have it highlighted in the notes, but that link doesn't work anymore. So I probably should take that link out. But uh, there's a famous study called the Brinson study. This is something you probably could, could search on. It's a very famous article. <laughs> um, what Brinson wanted to see is how important is that policy portfolio? And what his study found was that he was talking specifically about like pension plans. Pension plans, they invest money for people's retirement at a corporation. There's not that many pension plans left, but what Brinson did is they took the policy portfolio allocation for those plans, and they used that to try to explain the actual return of pension plans. And they said that policy portfolio explained 95, 96% of the risk of a typical pension plan. Now, the Brinson study has been misused so many times especially about wealth managers. I've heard so many wealth managers say the Brinson study says that the strategic portfolio explains 96% of the return of your portfolio, but that is not true. It does not explain 96% of the return. It explains 96% of the risk of the portfolio. It does not explain return. So your portfolio might be just as risky as your strategic portfolio, even though you're making tactical bets, but your return can be way off. Your, your, your strategic portfolio could be up 10%, but your actual portfolio only up 6%, even though you've explained 96% of the risk. So it's a very misquoted study. Uh, I hear it misquoted so many times by risk, risk, wealth managers. I correct them every single time because I'm worried they're telling their, their customers that, and it just doesn't make sense. But that strategic policy portfolio is very important because it's probably going to define what risk you're taking. Most important of all, is what your normal allocation to stocks is. We'll talk about that. Stocks are very risky. They're very volatile. So how much, you're, if you're gonna put 90% in stocks, 60%, 40%, that's gonna really explain to a large degree how risky your portfolio is. Your tactical allocation, that's where you decide whether the overweight or underweight certain asset classes. And so, yeah, so that's, uh, that's an important question uh, to ask. You'll be doing that on exam one in the second question. So even though this is this is the how question, I'm going to introduce it to you in the first part of the exam, the first exam, mainly because it's so critically important. I actually think it's probably the most important question of this entire semester that you understand that question extremely well. And you'll see why when we get to it. Very, very important question. All right, so we're going to get to the asset classes. <clears throat> Uh, I'm just going to throw them out today just in case you might want to do a little bit of research on some of these terms. It's really powerful not just to write, handwrite your notes, but it's really powerful to actually go out and research a few terms. Just go out and do an internet, internet search, research a few terms before you hear it in class. That way you've seen it, you have a little familiarity, and there's something great about long-term memory. When you see something in class, not for the first time, but for the second time, for some reason it takes it to permanent memory, which is a wonderful thing. That's really what you want. You want retention. You want to be able to remember this stuff uh, well beyond the class, especially this material, because this is very powerful for you 
because you'll need to make these decisions about your portfolio as you prepare for your own retirement. So the four asset classes are cash, bonds. We're going to talk about cash and bonds are really the same thing with a slight difference related to reinvestment risk and price risk. We'll get into that. Then we have stocks known as equities. I don't like the term equities. When I was when I retired from USAA, I was VP of equities, but they should have made me VP of stocks. We'll talk about why the word stocks is a better term than equities. And then alternatives. So be real careful and make it really clear from now on what we're doing going forward. We're going to define these major asset classes and then we're going to drill down into sub-asset classes. The cash and cash equivalents, there's no sub-asset classes, but for the others, bonds, stocks, and alternatives, there are sub-asset classes. What you want to be able to do, write this in your notes so you're ready the next class to do this. You want to be able to define the sub-asset class. You want to talk about it's it's the sub-asset classes, sub-asset classes. We'll talk about that. A good exam, ex, example is duration. You want to define what duration means, and then you want to talk about the different categories, which is long-term, intermediate, and short-term. And then you want to talk about the tactical implications. So those are the three things. Define the categories within the sub-asset class, and then the tactical considerations. That's where we're going. Powerful, powerful stuff. Um, so you can see now, if you get that question in an interview, someone comes to you in an interview question and says, I have $100,000. How would you advise me on what to do with that money? You can see I'm giving you, giving you some powerful, powerful answers for that question. Uh, I had some students actually interview with USAA right after the first exam for this class, and they, the USAA interviewer asked that question. And oh, she came, I knew the lady interviewing, doing the interviews, and she came out and said, my word, I was taking notes in the interview, not because uh, not because I was trying to get figure out which which person I want to hire, but because I wanted to go back and, and change my portfolio. So yeah, I mean, it's powerful, powerful material we're covering here. It's material you want to retain for the rest of your life. Don't, don't learn it and forget it. Memorize it, learn it, know it forever.